Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center and to tonight's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Let's inspire ourselves, as always, with a conversation ahead by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement so we remind ourselves of its urgent importance. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, before we start, I want to plug a couple of upcoming shows. Next week on Tuesday, June 15th, we host a great program about the First Amendment with Martha Minow, uh, professor at Harvard Law School, uh, Paul Matsko of Cato, Jonathan Rauch of Brookings, and Newton Minow, former chair of the FCC, who will make um, some remarks about uh, uh, Martha's uh, phenomenal new book. It's going to be a great discussion. On June 23rd, we continue our conversations about uh, how to resurrect the guardrails of American democracy with uh, Hari Han of the SNF Agora Institute and Daniel McLaughlin at National Review and lots of other programs, including our annual Supreme Court Review on July 8th. We'll take questions throughout the show tonight, so please put them in the Q&A box and I'll introduce them as I can. And it is now a great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, Peter Canellos is managing editor for Enterprise at Politico, where he formerly served as executive editor. Uh, he's uh, the former editorial page editor of the Boston Globe. And he is the author of the superb new book, the Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan, America's judicial hero, which he'll discuss tonight. Elizabeth Slatterly is senior legal fellow and deputy director of the Pacific Legal Foundation Center for the Separation of Powers. She is co-host of the Pacific Legal Foundation's wonderful podcast, DIST, uh, which explores important dissents from the Supreme Court, past and present, and previously worked at the Heritage Foundation and is creator and former host of the podcast SCOTUS 101. And Robert Strauss is a historian and adjunct professor in the English department at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of a book with uh, a wonderful title, which has uh, two periods in it, one colon, worst period, president, period, ever, colon, James Buchanan, the POTUS rating game and the legacy of the least of the lesser presidents, a great title, which he unveiled at the National Constitution Center in 2016. And most recently, John Marshall, the final founder, which he'll discuss tonight. Thank you so much for joining Peter Canellos, Elizabeth Slatterly, and Robert Strauss. Peter, let's begin with you in your uh, new pathbreaking biography of John Marshall Harlan, you tell a story of a, rem a remarkable correspondence between uh, John Marshall Harlan and Robert Harlan, where Robert warns John of uh, the words, uh, uh, do, do, take care. Tell us about what those words were, what this relationship, um, why it's significant. Uh, you've, you've resurrected it and it's really very important to your notion of Harlan's um, outlook and how it helps us understand uh, one of Harlan's greatest dissents, Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And I wanna say it's an honor to be at the National Constitution Center as a regular visitor. And I'm pleased that you have a Harlan exhibit there as well. Um, uh, the relationship between Robert Harlan and John Marshall Harlan was something that was known in their lifetimes. Some newspapers in the black community and racing press uh, reported that they were half brothers, um, but it has not been known since then the role that Robert Harlan played in helping uh, John politically and helping to keep him viable as a candidate for the Supreme Court. Robert worked behind the scenes to make sure that John was trusted as a man from Kentucky, as a man who came from a slave owning family. Robert uh, grew up enslaved in John's house uh, and was rumored to be the son of John's father, um, but he quickly became wealthy in his early thirties uh, from the gold rush and went on to have this amazing life where he funded black owned businesses in Cincinnati 
He uh, traveled to Europe to become a horse racing pioneer internationally, you know, bringing American mounts to challenge uh, British racers in the sport of kings. Uh, he then came back after the Civil War to the United States and became a major civil rights leader in Ohio. So he had credibility at this crucial moment in 1876 and 1877 when Hayes is becoming president. Hayes has promised that he wants to put a Southerner on the Supreme Court. But much of Congress is still controlled by the so-called radical Republicans, Republicans who were very mindful of protecting Black rights, and they were very distrustful of John Marshall Harlan. So Robert, in a series of gestures, one of which was the letter that you referenced, where he was quoting and what he called an old colored man who belonged to your father, who would always say, do, do take care. And the reason I think that's significant is because he's sort of citing a family link to persuade John not to do something that he felt would be politically injurious to him and hurt his chances of getting on the Supreme Court. The reason this relationship is significant is because Justice Harlan went on to become the sole voice for decades, uh, fighting strongly against the court's retrenchment on the defense of the post-Civil War amendments, defense of rights of African Americans starting with the civil rights cases of 1883, which took away uh, uh, the right to inns and restaurants and transportation, continuing on in cases like Giles v. Harris, which involved voting rights, the Berea v. Kentucky, which involved education, but most prominently in Plessy v. Ferguson, which endorsed the separate but equal doctrine. Harlan was a forceful voice for black rights uh, we, we are only realizing now because of the digitization of, of uh, African-American newspapers of the area, just how prominent Harlan's dissents were in the black community. They weren't really noticed at all in the white community, but they were very prominent in the black community. And his Plessy dissent, which had many memorable lines in it, uh, the constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. Uh, there is no caste here. Um, it's become a, a kind of iconic statement of the purpose behind the law and what equality means in the United States. And in John Marshall Harlan's mind, I think this was very much connected to uh, his father and his own background, which, which worshiped John Marshall, as Robert is gonna talk about, and were, were strong uh, supporters of a national destiny, the kind of national uh, power and destiny that John Marshall supported. That's how Harlan got his name. <laughs> um, but I also think that it reflected a personal sensitivity to the plight of African-Americans and that Robert Harlan is, is the answer to why he saw things differently than his colleague. Fascinating, thank you for introducing those uh, powerful themes so compellingly. Elizabeth, you have discussed many great dissents on uh, the DIS podcast, uh, including those of Justice Anton Scalia. And uh, I wonder if you could pick uh, one or two of your favorite uh, Scalia dissents, maybe Morrison and Olson, of course, uh, and tell us about whether you see any connection between anything in Justice Scalia's biography as, as well as, of course, his judicial philosophy and what led him to dissent in Morrison. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. It's a delight to be back at the National Constitution Center, even if it's virtually this time. Um, and I just want to say, you know, about John Marshall Harlan, he is truly an American icon. And I, I hope that more people will learn about him. You know, maybe it's because I'm also from Kentucky, or maybe it's my professional interest in dissents. And he is, of course, the great dissenter. Uh, but I have such an affinity for him. So I, I can't wait to hear more from Peter tonight. Uh, but turning to who I think, uh, who I consider to be the modern great dissenter, um, a, a new uh, Justice Harlan would be Antonin Scalia. And, you know, he, of course, was the king of originalism and also the separation of powers. And I think that's uh, demonstrated very well in terms of separation of powers with his masterful, powerful dissent in Morrison against Olson, which was only in his second full term as a justice on the Supreme Court, uh, but it's perhaps his most influential dissent. Uh, this was a, a case challenging the constitutionality of the independent counsel statute, 
which authorized the creation of an independent council who could lead investigations into executive branch officials. Ken Starr and the Whitewater scandal comes to mind. Uh, Congress gave the independent council um, tenure protection. So that person could only be fired for good cause despite being uh, a member of the executive branch. In a majority opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, the court upheld this good cause removal restriction because the justices determined that it did not unduly interfere with the exercise of executive power. But Scalia saw it a different way and he dissented in um, classic Scalia fashion. It's full of wonderful lines underscoring the importance of the structural separation of powers. And you know, just uh, to, to quote a few lines, he wrote, in the dictatorships of the modern world, bill of rights are a dime a dozen. What makes ours work is a governmental structure. That structure was designed to prevent an excessive governmental power, which is always the first threat to liberty from coalescing. Uh, and he goes on to talk about the fact that uh, the, the court says that the independent council does not exercise purely executive power. Um, Scalia saw it differently, and he says that this is, in effect, a mini executive uh, who's given uh, jurisdiction over, it may be a small area, but an important area. And of course, uh, this, this leads into perhaps the most famous line uh, among, among uh, uh, lawyers of a Scalia dissent, uh, him saying that frequently issues of the separation of powers will come to the court clad, so to speak, in sheep's clothing. Um, but this wolf comes as a wolf. He, he thought that the, the violation of the separation of powers here was so clear. And I think what's truly remarkable about this dissent is that yeah, though it was you know, a solo dissent just for himself, his view ultimately won out. Congress let the independent counsel statute expire. Uh, his his, his view went on to influence uh, the way that the, the current Supreme Court has approached cases involving who controls the federal bureaucracy. And I think Scalia ended up winning the hearts and minds of Americans as well. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we continue to see cases like this. Um, you know, there's even been another one this term before the Supreme Court involving, um, you know, who, who really is in charge of our federal bureaucracy. Uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you for quoting the comes as the wolf line so well and for introducing us to the great dissenter, Justice Scalia. Uh, well, we now turn to Chief Justice Marshall and in your new book about John Marshall, Robert Strauss, you call him the zealot of the founding period. You say he showed up in all sorts of unexpected places and should be considered a, a, a kind of founder himself because he completed the founding era project of creating a strong and united nation, uh, a, a single we the people. Uh, what you also begin very movingly by talking about how your, your dad got you excited about history and you talk about John Marshall's father inspiring him to read Alexander Pope and, and moral essays. And then of course, George Washington who was a sort of second father at Valley Forge and created his nationalist um, outlook. So tell us what it was you think in Marshall's biography that created this nationalist outlook and how it contributed to an important opinion that you highlight Fletcher versus Peck. One of the, one of the things I think about when, when I called him the Zelig, I mean, those of you who don't know who Zelig was, he was the character in a Woody Allen movie. He shows up in photographs of all, uh, you know, famous people from, from famous times. And, and uh, you know, uh, because we're here at the Constitution Center, we think of Marshall in his 34 years as Supreme Court Chief Justice. But prior to that, he really was everywhere. I mean, he was Secretary of State. He was a congressman. He was a Virginia legislator. He was uh, a lawyer. He was, but he was also a great party giver. And, and he, he was, as my mother would have called him, a character. You know, if, um, uh, you know when Miranda had seen uh, a... Uh, a uh, Marshall biography instead of a Hamilton biography, he could have done the musical Marshall instead with exclamation points. But uh, nonetheless, uh, he, he, he was, he, he, I think one, one of the things that Marshall did uh, as a person and a, a, I guess as a leader, he saw the Supreme Court when he was finally appointed 
as a, a tabula rasa. In other words, the, the three previous uh, uh, Supreme Court chief justices didn't do very much. There were very many cases. I mean, for, for God's sakes, we, we didn't have much of a country to uh, have cases against. Uh, so uh, when he when he got there, he also had a political bent because he was sort of the last federalist. I know Hamilton was around and still doing stuff, and there are other people who call themselves federalists, but mostly the Federalist Party was dying out. And uh, he was in opposition to the thoughts of the uh, Democrat Republicans. In fact, he was like like there 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 are Democrats who hate when 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 somebody from uh, the other side calls it the Democrat Party. You know, like it sort of sees it because it's really not. You know, that's not what they call it. So uh, uh, the Democrat Republicans were mostly called Republicans, but. Marshall went out of his way to call them Democrats to uh, to uh, to to well anger them because he 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 didn't get his political bent was different but also to connect them to the revolution in uh, France you know that they would come out if they came to power would would start something like that so his his bent though he I I guess he he decided that the country had to be uh, have a, a central government. Because uh, without it, uh, it, it would fray easily. It wasn't. It wasn't very long. It was only eighteen hundred. You know, there's a horrible election of eighteen hundred that that uh, 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 really divided the country uh, it, it, it much worse than anybody would say now. And and uh, uh, Marshall, like I said, took it upon himself to have a series of decisions over the years that would that would link anything he felt constitutionally he could to make it a unified country. He had the, uh, he also did thing, did little things like he made his, uh, early on at, at any rate, made his uh, fellow justices stay in the same hotel when they were in uh, Washington. They, he had, uh, his decisions were all uh, uh, unanimous. They weren't quite unanimous, but they, but the, there were no, there were no, Early on, there were no dissents. He he wanted it to seem like it was a unified thing. If it was, if the vote went for you this time, it's going to go for him the next time, and so we're all going to look like we're together, which would give the the central court more. Uh, I don't know, not power, but 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 uh, a, a panache, I suppose. Uh, at any rate, the Fletcher versus Peck, uh, which came the, the the decision came about in nineteen excuse me eighteen ten. But the the case went back to 1795, and 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 I think also Marshall was was judicious in picking whatever case he wanted to pick to make whatever point he wanted to make. Uh, it, it, it comes out of a, a, a dubious uh, set of uh, circumstances anyway. The, the Georgia uh, took it upon itself to make some money and divide what they called the Yazoo lands. There were Yazoo Indians owned tens of thousands of square miles uh, uh, that became Alabama and Mississippi, more or less. They divided it up into four parts, and they sold each part for $500,000 to developers. Well, that's sort of nothing even then. It was like a penny an acre or, 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 or something like that. And in any case, so, the, so the, then bribes go back and forth in the legislature, and eventually uh, the, the people don't like it in Georgia, and they vote the legislature out. So well, the new legislature comes in and, and has like a new one and validates the Yazoo Lands uh, uh, Act or whatever whatever they, they called it down there. Uh, there are these two guys, Fletcher and Peck, who had who had, were in cahoots. Uh, uh, Fletcher bought some land from Peck, and Peck had bought some land from the uh, in the uh, the auction of the the uh, the uh, original uh, lands. Uh, Event, uh, so anyway, the new legislature invalidates this thing. Uh, Fletcher, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, um, what, wants to have his his uh, his land from that he bought from Peck. He sues. There's there's a, a suit that goes back and forth, and eventually it gets to it gets to the Supreme Court, and Marshall invalidates the the. Uh, <laughs> invalidates the second law because the, they said you can't you can't have this 
uh, 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 new law and then invalidate contracts. And contracts were sacrosanct uh, in the Constitution, he felt, and especially between uh, individuals and states. And this was the first time a state law was uh, invalidated by the Supreme Court. So. Thank you for all that. Thanks for emphasizing the sources of Marshall's nationalist vision uh, for explaining Fletcher and reminding us that Marshall really did make unanimity a priority. He dissented seldom, only once in a constitutional case. And of course the dissent rate uh, went up dramatically, um, uh, especially after the 1920s when the Judiciary Act was uh, passed, but it was uh, much more of an emphasis on unanimity than there is now. Uh, P Peter uh, Canellis, although Harlan is most famous for his dissenting opinions in cases involving uh, equal protection and race, such as Plessy and the civil rights cases, um, you also note that he dissented in cases involving economic liberty, uh, E.C. Knight, the Pollock case, which struck down the income tax, the Lochner case, which struck down uh, maximum hour laws. Uh, tell us about those dissents and what in his biography led him to those positions. Um, I, the thing that's extraordinary there, and I had, uh, while I had heard about those cases, I had not fully appreciated until looking more closely in, into Justice Harlan's career, was the extent to which the Supreme Court played a role in extending the inequalities of the Gilded Age. The political will existed in the early uh, 1890s, around the time of the panic of 1893, um, to take some steps to improve the basic situation of workers on the ground. The Sherman Antitrust Act was passed. An income tax which had been used to fund the Civil War, but then canceled and tariffs were used to fund the, the federal government, uh, came to be viewed as regressive uh, the tariffs came to be viewed as regressive because essentially the same premium was paid for poor people and rich people if tariffs are being applied to basic goods. So there was an income tax that was passed. Um, then later on, you started to see states uh, legislating for health and safety in situations where immigrant workers were in terrible industrial situations with you know machines chopping off people's hands and uh, mill owners requiring people to work seven days a week and things like that. But the Supreme Court, for ideological reasons that really seemed very loosely tied to the Constitution, uh, took steps to curb these actions. They declared the Sherman Antitrust Act unconstitutional in the E.C. Knight case. It did start to back off of that after five or 10 years, but it took about 20 years to sort of clear the way for antitrust prosecution. The Pollock case, was a disaster because it required a constitutional amendment to overturn it. And for 18 years, there was no income tax and a lot of anger on, in the country about the way that the government was funded. The Lochner case, uh, which invented sort of a right of contract as a way of preventing labor regulations, um, you know, was used to prevent things like minimum wages at a time when people were really, really hurting. Harlan dissented in all of those cases, along with the race cases, and he did so in his own sort of inimitable, forceful style. Um, I think that what connected him to, the, to that was uh, some of the same values that go back to the original John Marshall, that go back to his, his time growing up in uh, pre-Civil War Kentucky. Uh, as we know, Kentuckians, feared the Civil War more than perhaps anybody because they realized their state would be a battleground and they realized that it would, it would tear that state down the middle. And, and Harlan felt that intensely. And I think that he, like Henry Clay, who was a mentor to him, like the Crittendons and Breckenridges and other leaders of Kentucky, um, he came to identify with a national vision and felt like the solution to problems had to come at the national level and saw the dangers of excessive states' rights. And so I think that he put himself in a position where he was deferential to the democratic processes, deferential to Congress, believed in democracy's ability to solve problems. Um, and that led him to be a dissenter in the economic cases as well as some of the race cases. There is a line you can draw between 
deference shown to the legislature in the civil rights cases of 1883 in his dissent to this in the civil rights cases of 1883 and the deference shown to the legislature in the later economic cases. So uh, part of Harlan's reputation, I think, rests on the idea that during the time of the Fuller Court, Melville Fuller's court, uh, the Supreme Court didn't serve the country very well on, on race and economics. And Harlan was really the sole voice, and in some of the economic cases, not the sole voice, but the leading voice, um, who were calling them out. And, and today in all of these cases, they've all been overruled or supplanted. Uh, Harlan's views are the law of the land now. So fascinating, it's such a uh, illuminating way of drawing the line between deference to the legislatures in the race and economic cases. Uh, his deference to Congress in the tax case has been vindicated. Akhil Lamar was on uh, last week talking about his great new book and, and he just showed how uh, Mar Marshall was channeling Hamilton's uh, brief in the uh, tax cases. And as a matter of original understanding, he was absolutely correct to dissent from the decision striking down the income tax. And um, you so thoughtfully trace that Hamiltonian vision to a, to a deference to legislatures in, in race and economics. Absolutely fascinating. Elizabeth, you recently gave me one of the best homework assignments I've ever had, which is to read the entire Dred Scott decision the majority decision, the concurrences, and the dissent. So we could talk about it on your great podcast. And I'd never done that before, although I've taught Dred Scott many times. And reading in particular Justice McLean and Justice Curtis's dissents was a revelation. And as we talked about on the show, I was so struck to see McLean recognizing explicitly that Madison refused to admit into the constitution the idea that there could be property in man. And Frederick Douglass learned that at the publication of Madison's notes, he said it changed his conception of himself as a man, as a citizen. And then there's Curtis's more famous dissent. And rather than uh, tell you what I uh, learned from it, I'd love to hear what you uh, think of uh, Curtis's dissent in Dred Scott and then inspire all of our listeners to do the really great exercise of actually reading the entire decision. Yes, I was. Um... So pleased, you know, to hear how delighted you were to read, to have an opportunity to uh, to read all of the opinions, because it seemed like every justice on the Supreme Court had something to say in the in the Dred Scott case. They had sort of returned to the the practice of issuing seriatim opinions, which uh, Chief Justice John Marshall had 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 fought against, and you know had inspired unanimity among his colleagues uh, during his tenure. Uh, so Justice Curtis's dissent in Dred Scott is, I think the best way to sum it up in one word is that it's, it's humble. He shows such humility. Uh, you know, so the, the majority, uh, Justice, Chief Justice Taney says that um, you know, African-Americans cannot be citizens of the United States, whether they're free or not, they cannot be citizens. And then he goes on to say that uh, Congress uh, cannot ban slavery in the territories and that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. And Curtis just takes down uh, each of these parts one by one. First of all, he says as, as, as a factual matter, Tawney is just wrong about the, the meaning of the Constitution. You know, he, he says he shows that at least five of the original states recognized free blacks as citizens. So Tani is simply wrong that the Constitution was not was not written uh, and, and, and could not benefit uh, free blacks in our country. Uh, and then he goes on to say, you know, the court should not be deciding this issue of the Missouri Compromise at all. This is dicta. Uh, the, the court has said it has no jurisdiction, um, you know, over, over the matter. And so it, it shouldn't reach the issue of the Missouri Compromise. Uh, but he says since the court it has decided it, um, you know, here's what I think. He says, the constitution doesn't clearly say one way or the other, whether Congress may or may not ban slavery in the territory. So the court shouldn't reach the issue. Uh, we should let the political branches decide. And, you know, I think a charitable, a very charitable reading of Chief Justice Taney's opinion or his motivations was that he was hoping to settle the matter of slavery um, as, as President uh, Buchanan would say, uh, settle the matter for the country and and move along. Um, clearly, that backfired, and I think that the humility that that Justice Curtis showed 
um, you know, would the rest of the justices would have been well served to to show that same humility. And uh, you know, I, many people are familiar with with Curtis's dissent, but not many people know that he resigned shortly after. Uh, and I think he's the only justice in history to resign in, in protest. And so what happened was he gave his dissent to a newspaper to publish it. And he says he thought that uh, that Chief Justice Taney had already, you know, allowed the publication of, of his opinion. Um, whether or not that's true, we don't need to get into, but Chief Justice Taney was not pleased. And he said about revising his opinion to try to address more of Curtis's points. And he tells the clerk of the court not to allow Curtis access to the revised opinion. And there's this frosty exchange of letters. Tawny accuses Curtis of not being gentlemanly, the horror, uh, and of requesting the opinion for partisan and political purposes. Curtis says he's entitled to see it and the public is entitled to see this opinion. And ultimately, you know, it, it was of course, uh, eventually published, all of them were, and everyone could see, um, you know, the, the shallow sophistry as one contemporary newspaper called the, the Chief Justice's uh, opinion. But this led Justice Curtis to resign just a few months later and he cited his lack of confidence in the court and a lack of willingness among the justices to cooperate. And, you know, you have to wonder if, if our country would have been better, better served if Benjamin Curtis would have remained on the Supreme Court longer. That's just amazing. What an important uh, backstory to tell. Uh, it's, it's remarkable that even having had advance notice, Tawny still couldn't respond to Curtis's powerful arguments <laughs> that five states, as you said, recognize the rights of free African-Americans and that state court decisions, including of North Carolina of all places, had recognized those rights. And you strongly show us how important the political backstory was and the value of reading dissents. Uh, so, uh, Robert Strauss, because you've written about Buchanan as the worst president ever, if you want to add anything more to the incredible interactions between Tawny and Buchanan at Buchanan's inauguration, when Buchanan on his inauguration day endorsed uh, uh, Dred Scott and basically said the Supreme Court's about to solve the question, and it issued the decision two days later. Um, and then, back to Marshall, he we, we can't uh, talk about him without his most famous decision, of course, which is Marbury. And there are many ways to tell the story of Marbury. Um, so, so tell our friends what you want them to know about Marbury versus Madison. Well, I love that Kentucky is so well represented here in, uh, in, uh, and, in both talking and, and, and uh, uh, Elizabeth's speaking here. Uh, one of the things about uh, Marshall was, uh, was a big advocate of Kentucky becoming a state because his father had moved there. And uh, were it to become a state, it wouldn't just be an adjunct of Virginia. It would be its own thing, and his father would, he felt, would prosper more. So he pushed that in the Virginia legislature. Uh, uh, but we have to remember how important Virginia was in the early uh, part of this country. Uh, in the 1790 census, the first census, it still had 21% of the people in the United States lived in Virginia. So when you know that all these founding fathers or whatever, you know, Madison, Washington, Jefferson, Monroe, Marshall, Patrick Henry, uh, and so on, came from Virginia, well, that was because it was the most important state. Uh, we, we've actually, in a, I, I view this as a, our country has gone from a Virginia-centric state to a New York-centric uh, country, excuse me, and now a California-centric country in a certain way. Those are the the, the, that we are not that the populations moved along with them, but but uh, sort of the sensibility uh, of the country. So uh, Marshall, uh, uh, though, was the was the outlier among the Virginia, uh, uh, you know, uh, popular leaders uh, because he he was a Federalist, and they were they they viewed Virginia as such an important state that. If we had to, we could make it on our own. Uh, uh, Patrick Henry was big on that, and, and even Jefferson sort of acceded to it. Now, not that they, not that they was a secessionist, but but there was this feeling that Virginia was all important, which is important in Marbury versus Madison because because uh, Marshall, uh, being a federalist and being 
second cousin and sworn enemy to uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. I, I, I also think all these people re related and we think how easy it was to become a founding father since even in 1790, there were only 800,000 white men over 16, which were the only candidates for being founding fathers back then. I, I appreciate the, 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 that we've gone further than that, frankly. But uh, so it wasn't that hard to become the top of your, uh, your, your uh, pyramid there. Uh, in, in any case, uh, Marbury versus Madison uh, uh, comes out of the, uh, uh, the uh, not, uh, well, Marbury, what, at, the end of, at the end of the Adams administration, there were, uh, uh, the, the, the election went on till February, and March 4th was the, uh, was the date that the Republicans were going to take over, and they were going to take over everything. They were going to take over the presidency and the two uh, houses of Congress. Uh, but, uh, but there were the, the, it's called the Midnight Judges. Uh, at the very end, uh, Adams uh, approved many federal judgeships or quasi-judgeships as Marbury's was, was, which was only uh, a being a justice of the peace in Washington, D.C. Now, you got to remember, Washington had about, who knows, a thousand people, you know, five thousand people, some small number. And there were several people like Marbury. Well, Marbury didn't get his commission on time. There were, there were uh, uh, 40, 50 uh, commissions of various federal judges. Now, remember also, uh, you know, the, the uh, I, I wish I had uh, stock and propitia for all the hair uh, pulling that, that uh, liberals had when uh, Amy Barrett was, uh, was uh, 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 finally approved. And now there's a six to three conservative split. Well, in 1800 or 1801, when Jefferson took over, he was president, he had Congress, but every single judge, every single federal judge in the country was a federalist because there were only federalist presidents supporting them, uh, 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 excuse me, appointing them. So this was, this was a problem that Jefferson and Madison finally saw, but could do nothing about it. Uh, so the one thing they did do is they passed a Judiciary Act that would, <laughs> that would delay the next um, Supreme Court term till February of uh, 1803. So the Supreme Court didn't meet for basically the first two years of Jefferson's term. But Marshall was looking out and he saw this case that he could do something about and it was Marbury versus Madison. Marbury was an operator. He was a guy who like would get uh, jobs collecting taxes or, or all these things, you know, uh, and he, and he uh, uh, claimed on the, the Federalist Party, not because he believed in anything the Federalists did, except give him jobs. So uh, one of the things he did was he found, he, he, he got a commission for finding the site of the, the, the uh, U.S. Navy building in Washington. So, but, you know, he wanted this commission because the Federalists, he saw the Federalists going out of power, and he better get this one, you know, as, as Justice of the Peace. So he sues and uh, uh, says that the, it's a, uh, it, it, it should go right to the Supreme Court, which Marshall, in the end, uh, 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 sends to. Now, what's interesting about the whole Marbury versus Madison thing is that who was the one signing the commissions at the last minute for Adams? His Secretary of State. Who was the Secretary of State? John Marshall. So, you know, for those of you out there that think that like uh, there's collusion uh, between the branches, well, Marshall was at the same time Secretary of State and Supreme Court Chief Justice. You can imagine John Roberts walking over to the White House one day and Biden saying, you know, I don't like the guy I got in here. You know, could, would, you, would you mind doing a couple of extra things for me, go up and uh, settle some peace treaties or something? Anyway, so, so, uh, so one of the things that Marshall uh, just found how to do, and I guess it really wasn't something that was going on in courts in Europe, is that he would take this, like I say, this case, find something in it that he could sort of parcel out to the other side. He was good at that. He, was, he, would, he, would, he would give something to the other side, and then he'd decide what he wanted to decide. So we're in this case where, where it should have been recused in the first place. But it, part, of, and part, of the, uh, 
part of the uh, 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 pleadings in the case were held in a uh, in a hotel lobby because the one of the Supreme Court justices had gout, couldn't make it to the Supreme to the basement of the uh, of the uh, uh, Senate building uh, where the where the the trial would normally be, and uh, so Marshall decided to you know do the Mohammed to the mountain moment, and he brought the case to this to the uh, hotel lobby where the where the uh, 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 the gout man uh, could could make it down to the to the first floor. In any case, the 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 uh, what Marshall does is he gives uh, the Republicans a little sop, and he says, "I can't do. I can't tell Madison what to do if he doesn't want to get this commission to uh, 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 Marbury. Well, that's his business. It's not something that the Supreme Court can decide. It, 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 it's not in my purview to to uh, go into uh, a normal run of executive uh, uh, branch." things. But what I can tell you is that uh, the whole thing violates the justice, excuse me, the Judiciary Act of 1789. You can't can't just uh, eliminate this position. And it's a convoluted argument, which which is hard to get into. But it's some of substance is is that, 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 that I think that gives us a good good sense of it. I, I wanted to uh, yeah. basically introduce it, but that's that sounds great, and it's right. good to know about how Marshall uh, really did engage in the kind of twistifications, as Jefferson put it, that would allow him to take away with one hand what he gave with another. But that that sounds wonderful, right. um, Peter. I, I really want you to put on the table as much as you can from your your book, which is so path breaking. There are, there are still major. Uh, dissents we haven't talked about, including in the civil rights cases of 1883 and the Berea College case. But what what else do you want us to know about those cases and about Harlan? And one of our questioners asks in the chat a a good question. What do you make of Harlan's uh, statements uh, about uh, uh, Chinese immigrants and Plessy, Harlan's anti-Chinese statements? Um, But but, but just uh, uh, tell us as much as you can about Harlan's outlook and how they influenced his positions in those path-breaking dissents? Uh, the Civil Rights case of 1883 was unlike Plessy, uh, which sort of passed unnoticed in the white community. The Civil Rights cases of 1883 was a matter of intense national scrutiny, national attention, extremely uh, high profile case. You know, the rafters were packed during the discussions, things like that. Um, Harlan until then, had been a very quiet justice. He'd been on the court for six years and he had sort of played the role of junior member. Uh, Morrison Waite was the chief justice uh, and Harlan somewhat deferred to him and deferred to the general idea that, um, you know, dissent was not always the best thing for the court's reputation. Um, And then suddenly in the civil rights cases of 1883, uh, Something, something clicked in him, something changed in him. He was older, he was on the verge of turning 50. His beloved eldest daughter who had taught in a school uh, where black children, uh, the children of freed slaves were taught industrial skills, uh, died in her mid twenties of typhoid fever. And he, he swore that every day for the rest of his life would be spent vindicating her memory. Um, he obviously had the longstanding relationship with Robert Harlan. And so he made a fateful decision that in this high profile case, by far the most high profile case that had happened during his tenure on the court, he was going to break as a lone dissenter. Um, And not only did he want to register his disapproval, but he wanted to come up with an entirely different sort of jurisprudence of the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments, the post-war amendments to the constitution. There's, there's a story that he was sitting uh, upstairs in his study agonizing over this decision and his wife had, and, and he had sort of writer's block and his, his wife's wife had a great idea. Uh, Harlan used to collect memorabilia from American history. And one of the things that he had collected was the 
ink stand that Justice Taney had used in writing the Dred Scott opinion. And you talk about a lot of influences on Harlan. Dred Scott was a big one because again, he was in Kentucky, 1858. You know, that was the moment that it became inevitable the Civil War was coming. It was a devastating blow. And he, and he saw how the Supreme Court can really get it wrong and really hurt things. So his wife puts the ink stand gently next to his, next to his uh, desk, on his desk, next to where he's writing. And by her account, suddenly the ink started flowing and it started going. So his opinion there, unlike Plessy v. Ferguson, Plessy v. Ferguson was sort of a, an angry, distilled statement of values. His dissent in the civil rights cases of 1883 was a giant treatise on the law. And by comparison, Justice Bradley's majority opinion, which was not quite the abomination that Justice Brown's decision in Plessy v. Ferguson would be, um, that was uh, uh, just a simple rendering that, well, there's no, there's no state action in these businesses, so uh, the post-war amendments are intended to regulate states, therefore no Civil Rights Act at all. So Harlan then painstakingly shows how in common law, things like inns and restaurants and transportation have been considered arms of the state because they provide services that are essential to commerce. He speculates that the bill could be sustained under the Commerce Clause, which is what actually happens um, 80 years later in the Heart of Atlanta case in 1965. He then talks about, you know, the ability to, the, the, the federal government's ability to legislate, to uh, enact the post-war amendments, which is explicitly written into the 14th Amendment. So this is a, this is a, a large opinion that talks very seriously about what these post-war amendments mean. When I first started studying it, the reputation was that, you know, it was a little bit all over the place and, you know, Justice Bradley had a good point. What I came away feeling is that there's a tremendous coldness in Justice Bradley's opinion. This is the opinion that said, there comes a moment when uh, people must stop being special favorites under the law and take the role of mere citizens. And, you know, Harlan shot back that it's scarcely fair to describe African Americans as the special favorite of the law. Um, and uh, the coldness of the Bradley opinion is very uh, striking. And Harlan's opinion, in, a, in episodic ways, anticipates much of the 20th century jurisprudence surrounding the, the 14th Amendment, especially. So that was Harlan's uh, experience in the civil rights cases of 1883. The Chinese cases, this is a, a comment was made, there was a law review article done about 25 years ago by a, a wonderful professor named Gabriel Chin, um, who insists to this day, and he read my book and he's blurred my book and I know him and everything, he insists to this day, and he, and he said in that opinion that he never meant to say Harlan was more anti-Chinese than other justices, just that he was not the hero to the Chinese that he was to African Americans. There's a line in the Plessy dissent where he says, there's another race so different from our own that we exclude them from the country. And then goes on to say, but they, he's, I'm speaking of the Chinese race. The, um, then he makes the point, which is a very valid and important legal point, that, the Chinese race was allowed in the white cars uh, in the separate but equal doctrine in, in Louisiana, the, in the, under the Louisiana Separate Car Act. So he was making a valid point that here is Louisiana saying, separating blacks and whites, it's all equal, fair and square. He's actually trying to say, no, no, the purpose here is to separate blacks. It's not to put each race in their own cars, to separate blacks. And that's the point he's making about the Chinese. But with that sort of lead in of saying there's a race that's so different from our own that we exclude them, I think some people can read it as saying that he was agreeing with the decision to exclude them. And there's a body of, ev of counter evidence of Harlan uh, having once dissented very strongly in, in a horrible case where the Supreme Court refused to defend the civil rights of Chinese people in a case where a gang of whites had like chased Chinese workers onto a barge and people were drowning. And it was, you know, Harlan was the only one standing up for the civil rights of Chinese in that case. Later in the Insular cases, he's the only one stating that 
uh, that without any reservation, Filipinos and Hawaiians deserve full constitutional rights. So the notion that he had a special, you know, uh, problem with Asians or with Chinese, I think is, is quite disputed. Um, and, and it's quite unfair to say that he was, uh, was anti-Chinese. There are some cases and some, uh, you know, evidence that he was not a hero to the Chinese, uh, that he was the way he was to the African-Americans. And I think, I think that is a point that, that Jack Chin and I agree on. Uh, but, but not he had some special, unusual animus towards the Chinese. Thank you very much for all that, for drawing that um, connection also between uh, Dred Scott and the civil rights cases, Harlan writing from Tawny's Inkwell and Harlan named for Chief Justice Marshall. There is a powerful symmetry. Elizabeth, you've been hosting DIST. You've talked about a lot of great dissents. Um, what's your favorite dissent among the ones that we haven't talked about? And what is the difference between dissents and majority opinions in terms of whether great justices, in other words, Marshall was great and he wrote mostly majority opinions, Harlan uh, and Scalia are more famous for their, their dissents. Um, if, if you wanna be great, is it better to be in the majority or dissent? I guess if you wanna win in the short term, it's better to be in the uh, majority. So, you know, just on unanimous cases, unanimous outcomes versus, you know, the value of dissents. You know, if you look back at the court that John Marshall inherited. Uh, you know, it was called by John Jay an institution that lacked energy, weight, and dignity. And Marshall truly is the man who made the Supreme Court, as Richard Brookheiser's great book argues. And I, I think part of the success of, uh, of, of Marshall's project to build up the Supreme Court um, Part of that, you know, was drawn from the legitimacy of unanimous opinions. Now, that's not to say that, you know, five, four opinions today, six, three opinions or, or you know, even eight, one opinions um, lack legitimacy. But I think in the in the early in the early days of our country uh, to ensure that the judiciary would be taken seriously, um, you know, it it. It, it lacked, you know, the essential feature to to execute its judgments. You know, as as Hamilton wrote in in Federal Seventy Eight, the ju judiciary has neither force nor will, only judgment. So it relied on on the other branches to uh, to enforce its rulings and and on the American people to um, to follow those rulings. So I think that uh, Marshall's intentional practice of adopting the style of delivering a, an opinion of the court instead of seriatim opinions was, you know, very intentional and, and helped to bolster that legitimacy. That said, you know, I think dissents are clearly very powerful, uh, as, as Peter was saying about uh, Justice Harlan's dissent in um, foreshadowing what, what could come for the later Civil Rights Act, uh, you know, basically writing a roadmap to say you could use the commerce power since you can't use the 14th amendment i think that that shows how important dissents can be you know justices have different different reasons in, in every instance for why they may uh, why they may dissent um you know justice ginsburg famously called on the legislature to act in a dissent in the lily ledbetter case which congress did and and, and heeded her her advice um Sometimes they're just trying to persuade uh, the other justices or persuade future justices to, you know, to follow, um, to follow their, their course. And, you know, sometimes they're just simply so the judge can sleep with a clear conscience uh, and, and state their case. Um, and so I, I think that dissents are very important, but, you know, unanimous opinions are, are great too. And we, we've been seeing uh, recently, uh, you know, Chief Justice Roberts, has said that he he thinks that unanimous opinions are important. And I think, you know, sort of contrasting with John Marshall, he used unanimous opinions to solidify the court's power. But I think John Roberts uses them, hopes for them, um, for the opposite, in the opposite way, to try to downplay the court's influence and mm -hmm. reduce the spotlight on, on the court. Uh, and so, you know, we, we often see, you know, until this morning we had, 
a couple of weeks worth of um, somewhat boring unanimous opinions <laughs> where the justices were all, you know, arm in arm, singing kumbaya and agreeing, although we are getting down to the last two weeks of this term and there are a number of uh, hotly debated cases coming up. So I think that the unanimity of this, this term may be ending shortly. <laughs> It may indeed. We just recorded today's We the People podcast about this morning's decision, which, not boring, were um, lower profile, surprising ideological alignments. Um, uh, and as you say, the, the, the best is yet to come. Uh, Robert Strauss, the last word in this excellent discussion is to you there. Uh, I, I, well, I wonder what you think about Elizabeth's really interesting point that Chief Justice Marshall's goal was to use unanimity to shore up the legitimacy of the court. Well, Chief Justice Roberts just says wants to shore up the legitimacy by downplaying the court's power. And you know, tell us how Chief Justice Roberts did it. He persuaded his colleagues to live together in the same boarding house. They discussed cases over a hogshead of Madeira. Was it his vision, his personality, his temperament, or some combination that allowed him to be the most successful Chief Justice in American history? I think just like every like Washington, he was the guy who. You know, Washington was the guy who made the de decisions on how it would be to be president. And everybody said, oh, OK, this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, Marshall was was a, a persuasive guy. He was a guy who had been around. He had been he had been a diplomat even in Europe. So uh, I think he I think he had a a, 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 a diverse background and a, a willingness to compromise within his court system. He didn't want to compromise, as Elizabeth said, in, in this uh, idea of unanimity, because the, the Supreme Court did have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 it, was, it was the third of three until he came about. And, and, and for, uh, I don't know, I don't know how you can say who's, who's more important or not, but it, but it certainly gave the Supreme Court legitimacy. And that's what, and that was his big goal, I think. Thank you so much for that uh, concise and illuminating uh, <laughs> analysis of, of, of how Marshall achieved his goal of unanimity and for wrapping up a really wonderful discussion exactly on time, which is always our goal <laughs> here at the NCC. Um, thank you so much, Peter Canellos, uh, Elizabeth Slatterly, Robert Strauss for a, a great discussion. Friends, thank you for joining. Please check out Peter's uh, new book uh, uh, on uh, John Marshall Harlan, uh, Robert's a new book on John Marshall, and Elizabeth Slatterly's wonderful podcast, Dist. Thanks again to you all. <laughs>